So why don't you tell folks what Open Social is and, and where it is today? I know that yesterday was a big day for Open Social. Okay, so Open Social is um, a way of, um, well, let me, <laughs> there's, there's different ways to approach it. Open yeah. Social is a way of, of defining social infrastructure for the web at, at, at its, at its um, heart. Um, and what that means is a bunch of APIs for representing common operations you use around social things. So that there are um, four primary operations there. There's um, who, who profile information about people and connections between people. Um, so we've got a fairly well-defined set of profile, um, profile specification, um, which is also maps to the portable contact stuff. Um, it's activities, things people do. So an, an event stream over time that's labeled by who did it and, and what they did. Uh, there's a data persistence um, API for open social, which is again coupled to people. So you can store small amounts of data about people and do a query back to get the, the, the same data items associated with the, with the friends of the person that you're, that you're looking at. So it's basically solving the rather messy database join problem of tell me about this person and their friends. You're delegating that to them. Um, yeah. And the fourth one is sending messages. It's, it's I'd like to send something to this person. So those are the sort of four key APIs. Um, and but the, the the point is to have a layer of abstraction between the container sites that have that are custodians of social data that have um, rich sets of information about people and the connections between them and the ability to, to do this stuff and an application that is focused on a particular task and doesn't want to have to replicate that whole stuff. Because one of the big problems of web development is um, to, oftentimes to do something interesting you need to have a database of people, you need to know who your users are and, and um, in particular if you want to do, do this kind of rich media um, filtering stuff that I was talking about, you need to know who their friends are and what the connections are and uh, information about them too. Um, in order to get that um, you end up setting yourself, you know, having this sort of giant annoying task to do of building a user database, deciding what fields to put in it, getting the users to fill in forms to tell you what, the, what they are, getting them to tell you who their friends are yet again on your side, and, and, and so on. And there's, there's sort of a whole bunch of busy work you have to do to do that. And what that means is the sort of the activation energy for, for building a social site becomes quite high because each user has to do this busy work to do it. And the first couple of times you, you do that as a user is quite fun, finding people is fun. By the time you get to the fifth site, it's like, okay, I, I'm done with this, I'm really not interested in doing this anymore. Um, and it has to be something really compelling to draw you in. Whereas for any given application, you can almost always augment it and make it more interesting by connecting it to people and to people you know. Um, or even just connecting it to information about you that you're willing to share. You know, if, if, it's, if I know where you are, that's a useful thing. If I know if you have other places you've lived, that's also useful. I can potentially connect you to information about those places too. There are, there are lots of things that, are, that, are, um, that can make the app more useful and more intelligent by, by drawing on context. Uh, but the problem is having to declare the context to the application each time is, is, is very annoying. So being able to draw on the context you've already established elsewhere is, is the sort of key to open social. Mm -hmm. And so we specify these, these different pieces of it um, and, and have APIs for doing that. Now, the initial um, implementation of it that, that came out a year ago um, and the, you know, the first couple of iterations on that, the model was um, embedding a gadget within a site. So you would have a social site that, that you already have your context in. You can embed a gadget within that um, that draws on the context and runs runs code locally and calls out to your server remotely. Just real quick, just explain what a gadget is if people don't know. So a gadget, so there's there's ways of putting one website inside another website. There's a, there's classically there's frames and iframes, um, which are little a little window of the site that is, is calling to an external site and, and drawing information in from that. Um, a gadget is a way of wrapping one of those up and giving it some APIs to connect to the site that's containing it. The normal model is, this is another site that has no idea where it is, but a gadget is a way of sort of breaching that boundary and getting information through, so that the code running in here can know that it's inside something else and do something about it. So that's the basic gadget model. iGoogle is the classic example of it, of it from Google's point of view, but there are many other um, encapsulations that are similar. Um, so what we found with the social network sites was that was a model that, that fitted their worldview. That was great. Here's an, we can augment our site by adding some features here. The gadget model fits. So the gadget's code base from, from iGoogle was, was open sourced and, and you know, handed over to the community basically to, to let them do that part. 
and then we added some APIs to the gadget that would tell you about the context, and tell you who's, who the user is, who the user's friends are, and do some of this data persistent stuff. So that was the, the initial model for open social, and that's been very successful. 600 million user base, um, social networks all around the world um, adopted that. Um, but for developers, that, you know, that meant they have to write JavaScript, basically. And there are developers who don't like JavaScript, and that's fair enough, you know, it's, a, it's a matter of taste. Um, so you could write a little JavaScript shim that brought back to your server, but it, it didn't feel natural for a lot of web developers. A lot of web developers really like writing server-side code because that's, that's what they used to do. So this, this is the, 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 the API, the server-based API? So, so one of the things that's available in point eight of Open Social, which is being deployed now, MySpace deployed it yesterday, High Fiverr deployed it, it's, it's, you know, the, the source is out there and you can deploy it yourself if you want to, um, is a REST API so that from, the, from your server you can call into the social containers. In order to do that, there's a whole bunch of open standards we have to use to, to do that, I mean, REST, REST being one. Um, we, have, we use JSON for the data structures. We use um, OAuth for the auth, auth, auth authorization. So I, I definitely want to hear this. What I want to know is, I, I know sometimes for someone who's in that particular field, they know what all these things are. But I want to make sure that, um, to open that up for mm -hmm. folks. So, so obviously REST is, is, is the server way that you access. So REST is basically, well, you don't have to explain REST. If you think about, <laughs> well, the way I like to explain it is, if you think about an HTML form, you're doing yeah. REST. You create, fit in a form, and you send a request, and something comes back. Um, and it's another page. Um, that's, that protocol um, encapsulated gives you an abstraction between the UI and, and the call, and, and REST is sort of taking that and, and formalizing it a little bit. Further. Right, right. That, 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 so that, what that means is there's a standard for fetching stuff, and it looks like, looks like using the web. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> So the other aspects, so obviously uh, JSON is the data format that you're returning the results as for this, sir. So JSON is, not so much, well, JSON is a data meta format, but basically JSON takes the JavaScript way of expressing nested objects um, and standardizes that and, and works for any programming language. So if you're using a dynamic language, this is extremely natural because you're used to the idea of nested um, lists and, and um, dictionaries or objects, depending on which language you use to call them that. Um, so if you're using you know, Python, PHP, Perl, JavaScript, um, Ruby, any language that is dynamic like that, this is a completely natural way to work. It's slightly culturally alien if you're using a statically typed language, because there you have to say, I've got this bundle of stuff and I need to make it into native objects. Right. And so it's, um, but you know, if you're using C Sharp or Java or C++ or whatever, you can still um, easily transform this stuff into something native. It just, it, it feels slightly less natural because you're used to the static types there. So that there's a certain tension there. I mean, we often find that people from those, from that sort of side of the language boundary, prefer XML, and so there are XML variants for it too. But the, the JSON was very natural when we had a JavaScript model, right, right. and it still maps pretty well for, the, for people who are, are doing REST. Um, and that's because um, because it maps very naturally to language constructs, it's fairly easy to work out what to do with it. Whereas with XML, there's always an intermediate stage of, is this an attribute or is this a contained object, and how do I map that through into, into attributes and so on. So there's, there's a bit of, extra work you have to do to decide what to do with XML, whereas with JSON, at least with dynamic language, it's really obvious what you have to do. So what is OAuth and portable contacts, contacts and how do they fit into what you're doing okay. as well? So OAuth is authentication. Um, if you want to fetch data from the web in public, you can do that. You can just you know, do a get, you get a, a chunk of data back. Right. So if it's, if it's a site that has data articulated publicly, um, then you can, you can draw it back in that way. The, the problem comes when you want to get at some data that is you need to log in to get to and you need permissions to do. Mm -hmm. So the, the, web, the web browser way of doing that is you'll do some kind of login, you'll have a browser cookie and the cookie will, will act as, the, as your sort of key to get in each way. Doing that server to server doesn't really work. So OAuth is a way to give you a token um, that you can pass in as part of the request to say, yes, I've been approved to do this. And there's two ways of sharing out this token. One is called two-legged which means you agree in advance that these are your tokens and this is where they're stored and it's basically a public key, private key model. And there's what's called three-legged OAuth where um, I have a site that has some data, I have a site that wants it, this site redirects me to that site, I say yes, you can have it, um, and then that site hands a, a token to the, to the um, requesting site. Um, and then it can use that token in future. So, so if I want to um, say yes, you can have access to my um, 
my home address, um, this site can have my home address, um, and then the other one can fetch it and say, what's Kevin's home address? Okay, great, and if I change it on that site, this one can still fetch it later. Or if I decide I don't trust that site anymore, I can revoke that permission, and then next time they won't get it again. So it's, 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 it's basically an authorization model, but it's a standardized one. There are several of these around the web. You know, Google has, has one, Yahoo has one, Microsoft has one, whatever. And OAuth is a way to unify that to a common one. And that's, that, that was something that I was, you know, that's happened in the last year or so, maybe slightly longer, but around that. And I was very interested to see how quickly and how well that went, the standards process. Um, because it was another one of these cases where a lot of people saw that there was a common problem um, they'd all sort of solved it themselves, um, and actually sort of them sitting down and hashing it out has come up with a, a nice standard that we can use across the web. You know, Google's already deployed it on all our data APIs. It's, it's, it's baked into open social as the authentication, uh, authorization mechanism, sorry, there, so that all those containers like MySpace and High Five and Orca and the other 20 or so that have already deployed will, will be bringing that out too. So that's sort of a nice little piece of web infrastructure that makes this stuff easier. So, so portable contacts. Um, <laughs> Thank you, by the way, for explaining. <laughs> <laughs> so, portable contacts. This is um, something that you know we have a, a standard for exchanging contacts at the moment, which is vCard, which was defined what a long time ago um, and was designed for exchanging physical business cards. And it has it's missing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, also, its structure is it's like email headers. It's like string colon other string, string code on the string. So it's not a very, um, you know, webby format. So, um, but you know, the, the, the data design is actually pretty good. It, it's, it's quite useful, but it's missing some things. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have a way of expressing URLs for people easily. It doesn't have a way of um, expressing your gender. It's not very, it, it, it has an extension mechanism, but it's not well converged. So Portable Context takes the fields that vCard has um, and remaps those into a, a sort of JSON structure, so you can you can easily map one into the other, bring VCard into it. But it also adds a lot of fields that we found people are, um, find useful um, based on the, what the open social work, um, looking at social networks, seeing what fields they have in common, and so on. So it's 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 a nice you know it's a, it's a nice straightforward um, format to pass. It's in JSON by default. There's an XML variant too for the depending on which flavor of those you like, they're, they're, they're readily transformed back and forth. But the goal of it is to be an intermediate format for contacts. Um, the other piece of it is, is that it's defined to be read-only. It's not defined for the read-write interface. Um, that was a deliberate um, design choice to make it simpler. Um, read-write is actually quite hard because you then, you're then layering on a second layer of permissions and a set of assumptions about who is in control. And you end up either having a you either end up with server decides or client decides, but you've got to pick one. Right. Um, whereas if you just say, okay, you can fetch this, just draw that in. That's that's useful enough that, that we'll get usage without getting us bogged down in the record locking, tombstoning, history stuff. Um, you can just you can just do this as a, a as a straightforward query and get the data back. So that's um, and this was this was sort of going on in parallel to the open social work um, and. When we looked at it, um, we realized it was the same. It was close enough that it was silly to have two, so um, both specs were merged. And so there's a bunch of changes to open social to make that work and a bunch of changes to open portable contacts. But what it means is that um, any open social container will become a portable contacts container. That's something that's really been cool about your work is that it, the open social folks have been trying to you know, not reinvent the wheel using pieces like OAuth, portable contacts, that others have been working on and bringing that in. Well, this, I mean, this is the web way of working. The, yeah. web, the web way of working is composability. You have lots of little solutions that you can plug together. And the assumption is you can add them together. Um, and also, there's the assumption that they're implementation independent. You know, the, the key for me, for a, for a spec, is that people can interoperate without knowing of each other's existence, just because they're writing to a common spec. If you, you, know, if you do that, then you, if that happens, then, then you know you've got something right. Whereas a, a, a classic model is, we'll have a business arrangement with somebody and we'll interoperate with them. We have to find everyone who's interesting and have a business arrangement with them. Now, this doesn't work. You know, it works up to a certain point, but you can't find all the interesting people because a lot of the interesting people are very small. Um, they don't know you exist. You don't know they exist. Or well, maybe if you, if you Google, they know you exist, but you know, they wouldn't know who to talk to. Um, and the, they're going to do something interesting, 
that you haven't thought of. But if you've got a common specification, they can actually interoperate with all your data. So that's that's the sort of massive power of open spec. And I, I've seen this, you know, over the years. I, I, when I was back at, at Apple doing um, QuickTime video, we did QuickTime streaming, and we did it using the uh, the ITF standards for, for video streaming. So we did it with RTP and RTSP and a whole bunch of codecs and you know, a whole bunch of crap that you really don't care about. But what it meant was we had standards implementations that would that would work with MPEG and would, would work with um, cell phone codecs and work with you know, a bunch of different pieces like that. Um, I would, as part of the video editing work, I'd go to the big video trade shows like MAB and there'd be people selling video routing gear, you know, which is, they're selling this to professional studios and they say, okay, fine. Right. And you know, I'd say, hi, I'm from Apple, and they say, oh, we don't have a Mac version, we, we only have a version that, that runs on Windows. And I say, well, what standards are you using? Oh, we're using RTP and MAPEC. So we, we just open it up in QuickTime and see if it works. Oh, it works, look. Nice. You know, nice. Same thing. We'd written to a standard, we'd, we'd run the, the test, they'd run the test, the stuff would work. And in some ways it wouldn't work, and it doesn't bug fix it broadly, but that's, that's what works. And I've seen the same thing with Open Social. There was a, a Korean developer, um, IDTail, who came to, came to visit, they were in, in the States, and they said, can we come and talk about Open Social? I said, sure. I was expecting to pitch them on it. I was expecting them to say, Open Social is a wonderful thing, you should, you should build this as part of your social network. And they said, oh, we already built it. Well, that's great. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, look, we use OpenID and log in here and we build an open social container. Oh, and here's our developer site in Korean um, that explains how other people can build gadgets. And I was like, okay, that was yeah. good. So that was, my, that was my sort of moment where I said, yeah, we're a real standard. That's now. a real nice validation. That, that's, that's like, yeah, this, this, is, this is where we are. Yeah. You know, we're seeing, we keep seeing that. You know, we, we, as we go around the world you know, talking about this stuff, we keep finding more and more developers who, who, who are already, already there and building on that. And that's, you know, that, that's what makes the web work. You know, the fact that any website anywhere can um, publish something, anyone else can read it. So we could talk forever. You've done so many interesting things. Unfortunately, we have to we have to start uh, bringing things to a close. Um, how do how do folks get in, in, uh, involved with Open Social? What's a URL? OpenSocial.org is the, is the main entry okay. point. That will that will that feed you up to a um, bunch of stuff. The site got revamped for the first birthday. People put some stuff in it, so there's actually quite a lot of good data there now. Um, there's Different. I mean, there's there's listings of where to get code and how to get containers there. There's also some good mailing lists. Um, there's the um, open social spec mailing list, which if you're interested in the details of how this stuff works and how it's going to change, that's a great one to be on. There's the Shindig Dev mailing list, which is um, the open source. Shindig is the open source implementation of open social that is running a lot of these large sites. Um, and there's a Java and PHP flavor of that. And there are people working on. Um, C sharp and um, Perl ones that I know of as well. So I expect to see more of those over time. And uh, just as a final question, uh, so I saw on your Wikipedia page you were involved in something called the Wide World of Animals for Japanese wildlife television. What was that? <laughs> well, no, what, what, so I did way back in the CD ROM age. I did this product called Three D Atlas, um, which was um, this was one of these things where again you know, breaking the proscenium, not putting a proscenium arch, rather than build what most people do with CD-ROMs there, which was like a, a narrative, we built a globe you could actually turn and zoom in on and overlay data on and, and build maps. And it was like, you, know, it's, you could call it a, a, a precursor, precursor Google Earth, if you like. It was, it was, it was pre-rendered and, and static, but it, it had satellite information and overlays and videos in it. So after we built that, and that was, that was very successful, it sold a couple of million copies, which was a lot in those days. Nice. Um, we did a success of that called Wild World of Animals, which took the same globe stuff that had information about animals on it and showed you with dynamic ranges of where they lived and videos about them and stuff. So that was Wild World of Animals. And the Japanese TV was, we got, I, we won a, several awards for that bumpers from Japanese TV, um, and we won one from the um, Wildlife Filmmakers Festival. So that, that was, yeah. And yeah, that was kind of the, the sad thing for me was that a lot of this sort of CD wrong work just vanished. There was some really good work there. there. There was some nice stuff yeah. there, but we were sort of, we were making shiny metal discs that people stuck in their computers. We weren't building something that, that, would, that would go up on the web. So, but it's, you know, we can put, you can put stuff up on the web now, which is good. So why don't you give folks the address for your blog as well, if people want to continue following your blog? Um, well, if you just Google Kevin Marks, you'll there find you go, it. There you go. But um, <laughs> it's epeus.blogspot.com. Cool. Thank you so much, Kevin. Okay. Thank you.